Right, welcome everybody. Um, lovely to see you here this uh, bright sunny afternoon. I can see a few uh, friendly faces in the crowd and uh, some new ones. Um, so this is the latest in a series of events that we have been doing for the Chartered Institute of Marketing. My name is Jacob Howard. I work here in marketing at Deutsche Bank, so I'm kind of hosting two times today, hosting for Deutsche Bank and hosting for the Chartered Institute of Marketing, where I'm the chair of the Financial Services Group. So last year we did some events on digital marketing and uh, GDPR, everyone's favorite topic. Uh, this is the first event of this year, but we have other events planned. And um, after the panel today, I'm inviting you all to come downstairs with me and we're going to the pub. So please do if you can join us. And we, uh, during that networking evening, we want to gather more ideas from you about other activities you want to see in this space. I've already heard um, in the past uh, 30 minutes, you know, I didn't know this was happening. Can we do more of this? So let's get all of your ideas and start to form this community and do more things that are relevant to you and financial services marketers. So we've got a fun, fantastic panel today. Um, open banking, what does it mean to financial services marketers? And I'd now like to invite the moderator, Daniel Henderson from um, Athlon to come up and introduce his panel. Good afternoon all, thanks for coming along. Um, quick intro about me, uh, so I'm managing partner at Athlon. Uh, we're an experienced design and transformation company. Uh, we work with banks, fintechs, and open banking, but I'll try not to be biased. Um, so what I'd like to do is just welcome up the, the panel, so maybe we can start with Eduardo, if you'd like to join me. Um, and if you want to do a quick intro about yourself to everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Eduardo Martinez Barrios. You can tell that I'm in Spanish, right? Uh, so yes, I've been working with uh, Santander UK in order to deliver all the open banking uh, initiatives that has been set up for the past two years. Uh, and definitely has been a journey. Besides that, well, I've been working with Santander Group for the last uh, 11 years, working in the uh, group-wide initiatives and as well in the UK, uh, the US, and uh, mm -hmm. other regions uh, where we operate. Uh, we'll also invite uh, Jasper, if you can come up and, and do the same. Do the same? Do okay. the same, obviously different company. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I'm Jasper. I work in marketing for Pension B, which is an online pension manager in the UK. So I joined the company uh, four years ago uh, as number four. Uh, we're now at 60, so it's been uh, quite a journey. Um, making pensions simple uh, and engaging, which is something that... I guess we all agree the pensions industry is not being very good in doing. So a really challenging challenge, uh, challenge brand. I uh, had a lot of fun along the way in building uh, a, a pension brand from the ground up. Before this, I was working as um, uh, well, I was working for a company called Simply Business, which is an online insurance provider, uh, also in marketing. So in total, I think 15 years of financial marketing experience, work making boring products cool. I guess. <laughs> Cool. Um, and uh, last but not least, Miles from Open Banking. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm Miles Cheetahman from um, Open Banking. I'm, uh, I'm head of propositions. Um, you might ask, what on earth is that? Uh, my job is really to understand what the customer wants. That's um, either the man in the street or the small business. Understand what they want. Uh, make sure that's reflected in, in what Open Banking actually builds. Um, I've been at Open Banking literally since day one, so it's been one hell of a roller coaster ride. Um, absolutely fascinating to see this thing go from uh, uh, a piece of paper called the CMA order, in fact, the CMA report when I first got there, um, come to life and spring out of this piece of paper and turn into something which is now starting to gather a huge amount of momentum. Um, Prior to that, um, not really a banker. I'm not a banker at all, uh, and, and uh, a little bit of payments experience, but most of my life I've spent in, in telecoms, working here in Europe for, for Vodafone and in Africa for MTN, uh, mainly in, uh, in digital product development over the last 20 years or so, something like that. Great. So we've got obviously a very varied audience, which uh, or panel, which is I think is really good. Um, but about you first, uh, just a little show of hands to help us gauge where you're coming from and where you're at and your understanding. Um, can I just ask, just raise your hands if you're a marketer by profession. 
Okay, that, that's as expected at the CIM. Um, who understands what open banking is? Let's be, let's be honest with ourselves here. Okay, about half the audience. Um, and can you raise your hand if your company is in the process of embracing open banking? Okay, okay, there's a few. So um, your work's cut out a little bit, Miles, to uh, promote this a little bit, but um, maybe we can start there with quite an open question. I'll direct it to you first, Miles. Can you just help explain what open banking is, um, for those who aren't so sure, and why is marketers they should all care? Yeah, sure. So, um, so open banking is basically about allowing third-party providers access to your bank account so that you can draw out the information, the transaction information, the account information from your bank and to initiate payments on, on your account. Um, and that kind of might sound a bit scary, but let me assure you it's totally secure. It's all under customer control uh, and it uses a trust framework, which means that, that nobody can get access to your bank account without your permission. And what this means is that third party providers can start to deliver services which effectively run on the, on the banking infrastructure. So if you imagine you have your banks and, and that provides all the plumbing for, for the banking industry, it means that new value added services will emerge and are emerging using that infrastructure plugged into the banks um, that, and that will spur innovation right across financial services. Uh, and that's really why it's so interesting for marketeers because it's a kind of step change. What the Competition and Markets Authority did when they, when they um, initiated this and, and wrote the order was they did something that no other comparable body has ever done anywhere in the world, and that is to, is to mandate access to bank accounts. Simply hasn't been done before. The UK is well ahead of the rest of the world. The rest of the world actually, by the way, is following and very, very interested in what's going on here. But, um, but we're making great strides in the UK as an industry in adopting this te technology. What that means is that customers will have a far greater choice in the products and services that are available to them. A lot of things which beforehand would perhaps have been a bit exclusive um, now can become automated so there will be kind of broader coverage of services, things that you, you know, where you'd have to pay for advice and things like that. Those kind of things can be automated. Um, and it will start to breed a, a you know, much greater innovation across the piece. And uh, it, it will change the relationship that people have with financial services um, over the next five to 10 years. Let's not get carried away. It's not gonna happen as a big bang. It is happening quite quickly. But you know, you'll see this happen over the next few years. Cool, so, so on that, obviously it's about spurring innovation. And you just tapped on the end. It's five to 10 years before we probably see the full uh, breadth of that. Um, and there's been a recent report, and I'll direct this one to you, Edu, um, about the failure of some of the big banks to uh, adequately deliver on open banking for their customers. So it'd be good to know your thoughts um, from a position of Santander. there. What, is it a competitive opportunity? Is it a market disruption? Well, definitely, I think is, uh, open banking, first of all, what leaves you in front of you is a whole network of, of, of uh, rails that uh, as at the moment then banks, we have the opportunity to uh, provide as many services as we want. And uh, of course, that will be leva through all the potential partnerships with third party providers. Uh, I think this is a very important point that uh, uh, at the moment what we are facing is a new way to uh, interface the consumer. So it's not just uh, across the regular channels that we as a bank may have is actually now we are uh, opening the door to uh, start working with other companies, fintechs, third parties, where we can uh, start um, amplifying our product and services to reach out the consumer public. So saying this, what I'm trying to, uh, to say is that definitely I think it's up to the competitive space of each of the banks to take advantage of these new rules because in the end, it's a, it's, it's a set of rules. And knowing very well the rules that we need to play with is about how do we do better. And at least this is the journey that we are heading towards. So. Um, and I think the opposing view from a fintech is quite interesting. I know Pension Beard done quite well recently. You've uh, been voted, uh, was it Tech Company of the Year by Evening Standard? Yeah. 
So well done for that. Um, but it'd be good to know your views. Nom nominated. Nominated. <laughs> has, it, has it been announced yet? Who Not won? yet. Oh, OK, OK. Uh, Fingers no, crossed. No, the tux is in the okay. wardrobe. So if you can tell us maybe from your perspective um, what the opportunity is, is it, um, what do you think is required to succeed in this space? I guess the, um, what we've always looked in terms of uh, the advantage open banking might have for us is um, it will make products like pensions actually much more accessible, much more, uh, uh, much more understandable because pensions is like your money for tomorrow. And if you can see that alongside your money of today, that's what uh, open banking enables you to do. So um, we, w we knew that we would never be the place where all, where all the account aggregation would take place. We will always be the provider of that data to banks because that's where people naturally will find that information in one place. So, um, but f suddenly for the first time, people were able to see their pension balance, a life balance that fluctuates daily. Um, they can make contributions um, from their bank account into a pension pot and they can see it all in one place. That's never done before, you know. Um, if your pension, most pension providers would still communicate with you on paper and ask for wet signatures and stuff. Uh, some of them actually fortunately had a, an online portal and now suddenly you can actually see that in a banking app. And I think that's been uh, really uh, helped us to enable people to make, to, to understand pensions and to actually encourage people to engage with their pension and save more. So people who have connected their pension B balance product within the banks we work with, um, their contribution shoot up, shot up quite significantly. So suddenly it just didn't went to a cash ISA, it actually went straight into a long-term savings product. How cool is that? And I think that is kind of like um, uh, for the bank itself, it creates um, um, a lot more brand aware, like uh, a much uh, a more customers are much more happier with their bank because their bank enables us enables them to actually take control over a product the bank might not offer. Um, they will stay with the bank for longer, um, and they might be more loyal customers to that bank because they just provide that uh, 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 the view of those products in one place. So, could you just expand slightly, maybe the, the marketing angle? How have you got from uh, idea to where you are, uh, you know, being a brand that has been nominated for awards. Yeah. Some of you have probably seen the advertising on the side of the train lines. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about the message? Because it's obviously very important for open uh, open banking that there are parties who are mm. talking about it because end consumers don't know much about it. So talk a little bit about the marketing channels and messages. So for us, a third of our customers daily are signing up through open banking partnerships. So from a marketeer's perspective, there's, there's a huge opportunity from an acquisition point of view. Um, so one example, I can one of the banks we work with is a challenger bank, which is a Starling Bank. Starling Bank has been at the forefront of rolling out Marketplace, where people would be able to uh, shop around uh, and uh, add more products to, the, uh, to their portfolio. Um, you can imagine that people uh, signing up through an app like Starling, for example, um, uh, we've made it super easy to sign up to a Pension B product to start the find and combine process of pension consolidation all in one place. All of those open banking partnerships combined, that's a third of our acquisition daily coming into Pension B. So it's been very, very significant in actually building our brand from the ground up. Um, so we're not just using our direct to consumer channels, um, whether that is more performance led or whether that's more brand led. Um, but actually the partnerships like we have with Starling, but also with Yolt, Money Dashboard, and some of the non-banks, more account aggregators, has been quite vital in actually building, uh, acquiring customers. Okay. So there is, there is really that customer acquisition point. So from providers like PensionB, it's an opportunity there. Okay, and um, Imran, the trustee of Open Banking recently was talking about how uh, we're starting to see the, the end of the beginning of Open Banking. People are organizations outside of you move beyond the regulation we're starting to see adoption in the market um, and it's been reported that many are saying that open banking marks the end of traditional financial services so good to get your thoughts are um, miles maybe on the impact on the market landscape um, and maybe how marketers should be treating their audiences differently yeah so um, <clears throat> I think the market landscape is going to change fundamentally um, you know, if you look at uh, if you look at 
where we are at the moment. We've got something over 100 uh, companies that are um, enrolled in, in, on our directory and live and uh, or going to, about to go live on the market, and a, and a queue of about another 200 sitting behind that that have applied for authorization the FCA. Um, you know, that's significant number of companies. I mean, that is going to have an impact um, on the marketplace. You know, there are varying sizes in there. You know, some of those businesses are small, some of them are, are, are rather large. I think one of the things that inevitably we're going to see is um, the arrival of some very big names in the marketplace over the next two to three years. Um, and these will be companies with much more of a kind of, uh, I want to say big tech, but um, uh, you know, much more digital thinking, uh, very customer focused, very much uh, thinking about the, the experience, the totality of the experience that they're, that they're delivering. And I think this will have quite an impact on how people start to perceive financial services and that will ripple right across everything. Uh, you know, I think it's inevitable that we see uh, some quite interesting market entrants as a result of, of what we've done at Open Banking. Um, and that will change this landscape, I think, markedly. You won't feel the impact immediately, but if you roll forward, as I said, you know, certainly five years, you'll see that it's had an impact. In 10 years, I suspect we'll be surprised at how much of an impact we've seen from uh, or, or change in, in the market landscape uh, as a result of, uh, of what we've done with open banking. Okay, so potentially a, a counter view, maybe not, but um, you know, market awareness and adoption is still low. Have you got any thoughts, maybe from your, your observations or a, a Santander perspective, why that is and what needs to happen? Well, definitely, I think it's about raising awareness. Uh, an example, I, 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 I was in an event, uh, uh, I would say a couple of months ago, uh, where a lot of uh, university students were there, and uh, no one was aware about open banking. And actually, I think that's a, a good indicative of uh, what's going on here. I mean, as Mice was highlighting, we're talking about that there are around 230 TPPs are in the process of getting uh, certified by the FCA or the National Competent Authority and start activity within the, the, the open banking ecosystem. But uh, I think what is important, what we need to, to mature is in the entrance of ideas that will generate use cases that, that will be uh, generating at the same time much more uh, engagement with the public. I mean, uh, Jasper has been raising their use case that is about pensions. That's just one. And focus on a particular topic. You can apply this to whatever you want. It's about, you know, triggering ideas, triggering implementations that are uh, uh, appealing to the customer that needs to be very much uh, customer orientated. And, uh, uh, and that's what will generate the awareness to the market because it's not about that we're going to publish papers about what is open banking, what can bring to the public. No, 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 no. I mean, that needs to happen through actually products and services that are released to the market. And they probably don't talk about open banking. Indeed. And, and, and why should they? Indeed. Like, this is the Indeed. whole thing. We don't talk about open banking. We mm -hmm. talk about the fact that you can see your, your, mo your money from tomorrow with the money of today. And therefore, you enable people to save more for retirement. Great. There must be other user cases, but let's stop calling it open banking because that sounds very technical. Yeah, indeed. And no, that's nobody's going to get up in the morning. And say, exactly. I need some open banking. Today. Yes, <laughs> I need to do some open banking today. No, that's not what you want. I want to download an app and get some of my accounts uh, in one place. That's what you want. Yeah. So, and I think uh, last year, like because it was implemented, um, there was lots of talk about open banking, also in the press. And I think a lot of people just whoosh, went just over their heads. Yeah. That, that message is obviously really important. Is there a is there an advantage to being a startup, a fintech who can have a single focus versus maybe a large bank who there's a multitude of messages and consumer t scenarios you need to talk about? I mean, did you find there was an advantage coming to the market knowing that you were just going to solve one customer problem? Well, the thing is, like, there's always a danger when you develop a product that there will be more requests coming in for ex product extensions or lot other stuff. So for example, do you offer a child's pension for children? Or do you offer a self-employed pension? Or can I open a new pension, which we don't? We do pension consolidation and we build a technology platform that you just 
tell us where you've worked. We know where your pension is. That took us a lot of, still does take us a lot of resource and work to do. And we're not big, so we, we don't have deep pockets to branch into other areas. So we're very good at what, solving one thing. Without open banking, you can imagine that might become a bit too narrow moving down the line because you might have other needs. I want an ISA, but we don't offer ISAs. We're not going to offer ISAs, we're pensions. So this is the opportunity that open banking brings to more niche players or specialists. The whole thing about having everything from one brand, I think that's gone with open, well, open banking will actually accelerate that. So people will have maybe, um, for example, a first direct bank account. Um, I have a first direct bank account, but I also have a first direct mortgage. I can see them all in the app, how, how great is that? But I do have a market savings account because first direct doesn't offer a very good interest rate at the yeah. moment, like 0.00001%. So I rather want to have 1.5%. I want to three account, please. I will, I will, I will switch <laughs> tomorrow. One sign up. But yeah. it, it, the thing is like, <laughs> but with open banking... Get the form out. <laughs> sorry. Thank but with, 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 with open banking, I can just pull my markets data into my banking app. And, that, and so therefore niche players will have the advantage there to actually offer product and do it really well. And I think the big players, like banks, mm -hmm. you will have some of the products from them, but they might not be good in everything. And they just pull that products uh, within the ba banking app. I think that will be perfect. So inertia has obviously been a friend to the bank for, for a while. Um, and Santander has historically done well. You've won the odd uh, customer experience award, which is great. Um, how, how do you compete against the new players? And you, 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 know, you dropped your one, two, three message there, but are there any, uh, <laughs> are there any specific messages that uh, are customer focused that can fend off the fintech competition? I, I don't think it's about fencing up. I mean, this is a particular view, okay? Um, perhaps another colleagues in the bank will say, no, 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 don't say that. No, but it's, it's about that uh, uh, literally with these rules, I mean, is, is, is a mandate that we need to open up our interfaces to, to, to the fintechs. So why, you know, be reluctant about that? I mean, we need to do it, as simple as that. So let's identify ways where we can partner up with them so we can offer, first of all, to the consumers uh, the highest level of quality in terms of products and services. And how can we do that? Well, identifying where we can apply synergies. As you were saying, you, you specialize in pensions. Yeah. That's it, pensions. Well, Santander specializes in multiple things. But of course, we will see some room of improvements in cer certain areas with, where we can actually work alongside with a specific third party provider that they might be experts in those areas where we identify room of improvement. Miles, do you, you agree? Do you think that? Um banks, this, this approach of partnerships is the right one, is there more they could and should be doing to, um, for the consumer to understand it and encourage them to ad adopt the, the new platforms? And um, I think there's a lot more that they could be doing. Um, I'm going to be a little bit provocative. That's why we sat Jasper so in the middle here. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> and uh, insofar as um, <laughs> I mentioned that uh, my, I'm not a banker, in my background is telecoms. So what's really interesting in telecoms is how uh, organizations, the big telecoms players, have seen their revenues uh, dramatically impacted by the arrival of Skype and WhatsApp and WeChat and Facebook Messenger, um, services which in effect sit over the top. They use the telecoms infrastructure in the same way as open banking uses the banking infrastructure. And what's happened here is that you have a product like Skype or, or WhatsApp as examples, who have a fundamentally different, that has a fundamentally different business model, and actually the telecom players have not been able to compete with that. Um, and it, it makes it very, very difficult when actually as a, as a telecoms provider, you're faced with competition from somebody who is playing in an in, entirely different way where their revenues are not coming from subscriptions and messaging in the same way that you are as a, uh, as a traditional telco. And, and I think that's one of the cultural changes that the banks are going to need to adapt to, is that they're not on a level playing field. 
and that um, in a world where, for example, revenue can be made from data mining and advertising, and you have a business model that looks fundamentally different to the one that you, you are used to, that can be incredibly disruptive. And I think that's one of the effects that we will see. Um, now, the banks, in my view, are not moving fast enough um, and don't recognise that threat as clearly as, as, they, as they should do. And, and I can tell you I've spent many, many hours and years working in, in innovation and in, and in business planning in telcos to know just how wrong I personally got it on some occasions. Um, you know, and with hindsight, I think uh, you know, a lot of telcos would have moved further and faster and would have listened to the, this kind of competitive threat um, at a time they could do something about it. And now many of them are on the back foot uh, and but, struggling. But is this a case that, um, um, correct me if you disagree, but maybe the banks aren't seeing the, the consumer demand um, and therefore why invest in being proactive in innovation? I mean, what, 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 is there a one that trumps the other? Do we need consumers to be demanding new services well, for I, the banks to go, hang on, we need to provide it? You know, I'll tell you what is that, you know, what happens is these things can pop up so quickly um, and culturally, large or any corporation has got, a, I would say, at least a minimum 18 months to be able to introduce something new. Whereas uh, a digital, a small digital startup can bring a new product to market in, let's say, three to six months if they really work hard at it. And what you have is almost like um, a sort of Darwinian effect, I would say, where, where you have digital products which, Im which evolve and iterate so quickly and adapt themselves to customer demand that the larger corporations struggle to keep up with that um, rate of innovation. And, and what happens is customers see something, they want it, they get on board really quickly. You see this in the digital world. And before you know it, then your, the, the, the large corporation is hemorrhaging revenue, it's hemorrhaging customers in that particular area. And it's usually something specific. Um, and you'll find that actually then they have to start playing catch up all the time. Uh, and that, that's the challenge with, with all of this. Um, I think that there is a there's scope for a huge amount of disruption in the marketplace. And uh, in fairness to the large banks, you've had to weather the, the GDPR storm, which we all had fun dealing with. Um, and then this regulation comes along and it's, there's a lot of stick and no carrot. Um, how do you adapt from doing what you've regulated to do into meeting the consumer demand and, 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 and spearheading that? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's a good question, uh, and, and I think there are examples where you can see that there are some clashes uh, between uh, what we're doing through the, the CMA order uh, and PSD2, uh, and at the same time there are other regulations that more or less uh, uh, raise some kind of uh, friction in terms of how to do this, uh, uh, particularly for uh, the authorized push payments regulation from the FCA, where we need to uh, be quite straight to the consumer when the, they are prompted to do a, an authorized push payment. That means that every time that you do a, a payment and that payment perhaps goes uh, uh, um, out of your um, regular payments, you need to be asked uh, multiple times about if you're sure to do the payment. So literally, from the uh, customer experience perspective, uh, it's not a, a, a friendly way to implement this kind of uh, requirement uh, against to a, 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 a supposed to be super slick interface in order to facilitate uh, the, the consent journey uh, for a consumer to authorize a third party to access or to uh, uh, be able to initiate a payment itself. So uh, there are, I think, plenty of, of opportunities to do this better. As Mal was saying, the UK has been the, the, the first one to, to implement in such a way this, because you see other markets that uh, in a, in a uh, auto-regulated way, they have uh, introduced some kind of initiatives, but like uh, has been implemented here in the UK, uh, we're the first, and uh, many other markets are literally looking at, at us uh, in order to understand how can they implement this uh, set of uh, standards in, in another markets. So, I think definitely some maturity needs to happen. And uh, uh, banks, we need to, yes, acknowledge that there are some risks. And we need to be mindful about how 
to tackle those risks, but I, I would say from a positive way. I mean, because literally these are the, the, the set of rules that we need to work with, and I've been saying this already several times. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we all know the UK is a, is a great hub for fintech and for new products, and um, it feels like we, in some ways we are a guinea pig. There are probably some creases to iron out, but we are seeing success with fintech. So, I'd be curious to know if you can cast your mind back to the day you thought, ah, oh, pension B. What, what was the insight? What made you think, you know what, we, we can do something and we can adopt open banking? Uh, I think the first, the first request, uh, I think the first idea when we could use open banking initially was when uh, we have a lot of self-employed customers. And they don't save for a pension. Um, but they struggle to contribute on a regular basis because their income is irregular. So why wouldn't you want to connect your bank account? with your Beehive, your online account or your, mobile, your, your pension B app. And every time your client pays, you, a percentage of that invoice is being paid into your pension. That means that you need to connect your business bank account with that. Hasn't happened yet, by the way. It's, it's something we are scoping out. But that's basically alter enrollment for self-employed. If you think about that, how cool is that? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I used the word cool now twice today. <laughs> but <laughs> that is a really good solution for somebody who struggles to save for retirement because you do, but you, you don't do it on a monthly basis, one invoice. That's where we thought, wow, that would be great if that would be possible. And then we started to talk about, um, and then we, uh, we met Starling, which was our first open banking partner. Um, and um, they talked about account aggregation. So it was all about seeing all your balances in one place. We didn't solve the business case initially, if I'm mm -hmm. really honest. But then I saw it myself in the app and I was like, wow, I didn't know you could do this. And I think when it comes back to, is this consumer driven or is this innovation driven? Um, it's sometimes one or the other. Uh, in case of the balance, it wasn't consumer driven because I wasn't really like research and our customer feedback didn't, it didn't show that customers wanted that until we've actually built it and we tested it. And suddenly overnight we had to stay late and man the live chat and the sign up because we could not stop the influx of people signing up to Pension before the Starling app. And it was just, it was great. <laughs> but it was like, why didn't we saw this coming? So sometimes you need to create something for a consumer to think, oh, wow, this is absolutely great. But on the other hand, with the self-employed, that was definitely driven by customer feedback. And did you have, I mean, having worked on the, uh, the um, user experience design for open banking, yeah. I'm, I'm well aware there's, there's obviously some challenges with, yeah. through the consent process. Um, you used the word call a lot, but were your customers using call? Because from a marketing perspective, they've got to think, if we do something, what's the backlash? What are the challenges we're going to have in our comms and our, our, our brand perception? Yeah. So were they all saying cool? Uh, no, they won't all say cool. Some of our <laughs> customers are 65 plus uh, okay. because they're drawing from their pension. Um, I say we typically, especially our first wave of customers are definitely early adopters or innovators where they absolutely um, think things we do are, are cool uh, as in like, you know, innovative. 80% uh, of our customers are not based in London. So we often say we don't do it for uh, Bearded James and Shoreditch, but we do it for Jane in Cardiff. And that's kind of like our real customer. She is, she is a pension B customer, uh, has an average pension of 40K um, and isn't into open banking or all of that stuff. She might use the open banking app, but that's our bread and butter of our customers today. So um, it's, um, 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 I would say it's definitely, um, we're building products for her, and she might not think we're cool, but we solved the problem. Okay. And that was lost pensions, and she can now see it in one place. I'm gonna come back to target audiences and propositions, yeah. so I think that's really important for this, okay. but because um, I like to delegate work, uh, it's your turn. So, Jacob, you've got a microphone. Yeah, Has anyone got a question? Oh, cool. Um, quick question. Um, you talked in the beginning uh, about data security. But when we're talking about uh, all of our status in new oil, it's not just the security, it's a integrity, ownership uh, on that one. So um, I'd like to have your views on what you think about the actual ownership of data and what happens if along that process some mistake creeps in. Say, for instance, you've got a customer with his behavior suddenly get a, gets a foul credit rating and everything is shared immediately and spread immediately. How can this person be under control again in correcting this information 
And who would he or she point at with the wrong information? Because we currently just look at the fantastic bright future, everything is cool, easy and stuff. But imagine later on in the future that you're almost scared to share something because you do not know where it ends up and who owns it. So can you tell, a, a tell you know, us about that? Because as a banker, the first thing that, that I learned is risk management. It's like it was hammered in my head. First of all, I mean, from, from the bank perspective, okay? But this is already happening. You have technology out there that is called screen scraping where you are allowing as a consumer to uh, uh, a third party to impersonate and to impersonate you because you provide the credentials of your bank to access your bank account and this is to me the, the big risk because literally you you give that access and they can do whatever they want i mean the tpp may say i'm doing this but the the technical method itself to access i mean could i mean is accessing your bank account, like you might be doing it yourself. So that's happening already. What happens with APIs is actually that you provide a specific consent and a specific authorization to access a specific set of data. So it's not a, a, a blank check to the third party to do whatever they want. So this is the first point. And then in terms of controlling uh, who access because you perhaps have granted authorization today, and in six months time, you perhaps have granted, I don't know how many authorizations, and you forgot. So banks needs to provide a consent dashboard where the third, I mean the customer has visibility on all the authorizations that has granted and can turn off the consents as the customer considers uh, you know, appropriate. So, that's, that's a, a, I think, a much better way to control the data that actually of what is happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the work we did with you guys, and we did like 200 uh, prototypes on the APIs and the user journeys to identify the understanding and communication. Now, um, there also is a lot of concern around data. Uh, how important was thinking about the consumer journey and that, that concern Users may have in the work that open banking were doing. It was paramount. I mean, that's where we started. Was this place? This goes nowhere unless customers trust this. And in order to trust it, <coughs> they need to have control. So it was absolutely fundamental. It was very one of the very very first things that uh, that we started to work on was how we're we going to build this and how we're we going to make sure that this remains within the control of the customer. Because if we can't achieve that, then all this is for naught. Um, and, and just building on what Eduardo, Eduardo has said, uh, you know, I think we're actually at something of, in something of a kind of uh, a step change in the way that customers um, see and perceive the level of control they've got over their data. Um, because if you think about where we are today, um, people have been cheerfully sharing their personal data through social media. Um, through all manner of things, every time they Google things. Um, and all of that has built up this big profile about them, and actually they have very little control over that. And, and I think one of the things that we are hoping that will, um, that will emerge as a result of the work that we're doing is that people will begin to understand that it is possible to have very uh, tight, fine-grained control over what they do and don't share. So building on the things like the dashboards and, and, and the way that, that, that you grant consent and how you revoke consent and all of those kind of things. Um, and, and this is a continuing theme in open banking. Last year we published the customer experience guidelines and, and that basically spells out in, in detail what you need to do, not just from a regulatory point of view, but in order to deliver a good customer experience. And that's really all about providing this level of control throughout the customer journey and making sure that the, the customer is doing this in an informed way. But we're continuing to work on um, how, how you would, uh, for example, uh, raise the level of comprehension or, or speed up the time that customers mm -hmm. take to comprehend what's being presented to them. And, and, and that, that is 
um, presented to them in ways which is easy to assimilate, that it works within the, the framework of the customer journey and actually improves the propensity to share their data through these third party providers. Um, you know, it's no small task, but um, there's been some very interesting work done through um, Department of Business Energy and Industrial Strategy, the, and the Behavioural Insights team have recently done uh, uh, some work which is about to be published, um, which looks carefully at, you know, this, this thing about, you know, scroll, 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 I agree when you're signing up to something. Um, and they've kind of broken that down and looked at techniques to try to improve the level of understanding and, and so on. Um, and they've come back with some very interesting and simple things that you can do. And, and we're working with, with um, that organisation um, and we'll be uh, assimilating that within our customer experience guidelines. We're also talking to, um, to other parties and sharing experience from around the world where, where this is also developing. In Australia, um, the, uh, the consumer data right uh, legislation, which is about open data, is a more broad open data initiative. It includes open banking, but it, it touches on other sectors as well. They have a very similar kind of challenge, and, and we're getting perspectives from what those guys have learned as well. Um, and we will assimilate all of this, but it's all, it all goes together to, um, to create a world which we expect, uh, where we expect the customer to have much greater understanding about what they're doing, what they're sharing, what the purpose is, and to be able to control and revoke uh, the consents that they've granted. It's extremely important. Yeah. I think cool. we've got some next question. questions. Um, hi, Ed Koch, Repute Associates. Um, Given the context of the financial services industry, which hasn't got a particularly strong reputation, particularly around um, the retail, the big retail banks, I wanted to get your views on what you see as the biggest reputational advantage to adopting open banking. And the flip side, I expect, I suppose, sort of building on the previous question is, what are, what's the biggest risk you see from a reputation perspective? So how can you leverage something um, as, uh, apparently as strong as this to the brand's advantage rather than um, uh, simply kind of adopting it because it's a good thing to do. Who wants to go first on that one? Oh, I'll take that. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> well, I yeah, it's a, it, that's a really um, good question because, um, you know, why just do something for the hell of it? You know, there's got to be a real advantage in it for the customer. Um, you know, the, the first question is, in any proposition, what's in it for me as a customer? Um, and I think what what we can do through open banking is um, provide uh, a much richer, much more informed uh, experience all around and, and develop better products simply because we have a much better view of the customer. So um, if, you, if you just think about account information, in a way, um, it's like a window into your soul, into your life, everything that you do. And um, what we're beginning to see is people um, that are developing products which are, uh, which are kind of trying to ask the question of how can we take this information and make it truly valuable for our customers? And how can we uh, combine that with other data sets in order to deliver things which go above and beyond and help people to genuinely live their lives. You know, a lot of what we do is about saving time or saving money or making money. And I think what we'll start to see is those brands that resonate uh, more clearly with the customer will be those ones that can, can show how the customer in the value exchange, I mean, when I say I'm going to share my data with you, Mr. Third Party, that I get something back which I feel genuinely enhances that my life and the tasks that I've asked you to do. Um, and, and that's where I think the, the brand strength comes into it. The better you can, you can meet that, that, that need, then the greater the, the brand affinity that people will have. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, it's, it's not rocket science, you know, it's common to any kind of product development, but I think what we're doing now is we're starting to take that in, into sort of new levels. Uh, there's, a, there's a great deal of potential for really developing things in, in a very, very interesting way. Um, you know, and it's not, um, I'm kind of just going to talk about just something slightly to one side of this as well, is that um, there are some very interesting initiatives. I, I, I'm aware of an initiative in, in, um, uh, in Edinburgh that I'm partly involved in, where the University of Edinburgh is, is, is uh, uh, bidding to create what they call a global open finance centre of excellence, where they're going to start by um, developing 
a, uh, a sandpit for um, third party providers to test their algorithms and to combine that data set from the financial services side with, um, with uh, data sets from other industries. I think this is a very interesting thing which ultimately will, will deliver some very, very exciting products. I mean, very, very early days. Um, they're doing it in, uh, I think, quite an intelligent way where it's not just infrastructure based, but they are also investing heavily in, in, in uh, training for data engineers and the skills required for, uh, for artificial intelligence. Um, and that, to me, is a kind of fantastic building block for products which in the future really go straight to the heart of the things that people want to do, the tasks that people are faced with every day, making lives easier, simpler, uh, kind of cutting out a lot of mundane stuff, making things more accessible that weren't accessible previously. Uh, you know, I think we're on an interesting journey. Yeah, and from my perspective, what I'm seeing amongst the companies that are talking to us is that they've gone out of the regulatory phase, now they're in the what do we do, and it always <coughs> starts with that proposition piece, what's our right of play, what do our consumers want, not should we just be doing it because uh, others are doing it, the, the, the stepping journey, so maybe there's a piece. And, and, that, and, that's a, and that's a very important point, and, and regarding to the branding part, uh, I mean from a bank perspective, definitely we are the, very cautious, because literally uh, you will see third party providers that they will, I mean they are already knocking on the door trying to do things with you based uh, on open banking standards, uh, and, and they trying to perhaps live up their brand using the, the bank's brand itself. So it's, mm -hmm. it's about how you maintain an equilibrium because, I mean, something definitely uh, is uh, that, yes, we deliver the standards. We are com more than compliant. We are keen to operate within the ecosystem. But it's, a, it's as well to how do you maintain the integrity of your brand at the same time uh, uh, playing the, within the new rules and identifying uh, ways to lever your brand as a bank with innovative propositions that will actually be a, a good uh, service or a good new product to the market. So it's, it's not easy because this is new. Nobody knows uh, you know, uh, perfectly what to do. It's about uh, understanding how things are evolving being very careful with the uh, steps that we do, but uh, I think the direction is set up. Is uh, I mean, we just need to look forward, and being you know quite uh, uh, to keep the pace uh, quite steady. If I give two examples, just very short, two examples of how a, a bank, for example, um, uh, could really add value to you know something that's available like open banking. What if the, your customer could see? if they should overpay their mortgage or they should pay into a pension? What if your bank could answer that question uh, because of that information is all available but you've added value by offering a tool or a calculation or an algorithm to it? Um, what if, and that's the second example, what if, if um, I, the bank could give me an answer how much I should pay into my pension so I get a good retirement because I can see the pension me pension, oh, but I also have an auto-enrollment pension from work. And that's also available through, uh, through open banking. So, for example, we believe that the pensions dashboards should be delivered through open banking. It shouldn't be um, a very close-knitted thing that's been developed for the last 15 years or so, and it's not due for still a couple of years. Open banking can, can answer those questions for, for the customer who is banking with that particular bank. How would the customer feel if he, would, he or she would get answers to those questions? I think that's what we need to think about, and that's what Open Bank can provide. Yeah, yeah. I might, I might collect up two, two lots of questions. Thank you. Um, I have a question about going back to uh, explaining or communicating to customers what open banking is. Uh, is it necessary or at all? A uh, bit of background, I work for Account Technologies, which is a fintech company. Uh, we have around 400,000 customers. Uh, using screen scraping at the moment, as was just discussed, for most of them. Uh, but we are on the verge of, well, we have a lot of customers on open banking. We're live in the market uh, already with around 30,000. And before end of September, we need to migrate all those customers onto open banking. So that's, uh, that's a big task. And um, we are already the largest consumer of APIs in the market at the moment, uh, one million API calls a day. Um, my question is, 
migrating all those customers onto open banking, do we need to explain anything to our customers? Because as Eduardo was saying, yes, it's it's very great because uh, it's about innovation and product, which is something that is done between TPPs and banks or together. Um, but but people who are now using financial services and moving over to, to open banking, do they need to know anything? Is it about explaining more the, the safety part of it, that it's more secure than than, uh, than screen scraping, uh, or or is there is there anything else to, to explain? So what's the key message? Let me give you another question to ponder as well. Actually, uh, in line with that and in line with what Christoph said, and I agree, a lot of the stuff that's happening is cool, but um, when opportunities like this exist, everybody is thinking about how cool would it be if we do this? But when it goes wrong, no one is, is, is to be seen. So. Uh, sorry, Gunnar Steve and I work for Sokjan in the Corporate Investment Bank, and we've had our fair shares of experiencing what happens when it goes wrong. And so the question is, um, your granny in Cardiff, you know, does she care how it works? You know, age 65. What, who does she talk to when things go wrong? You know, talking about um, things you talked about, you know, when you scroll, 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 I agree. But what if it goes wrong? Not just when I agree, you know, who do they talk to? And I think, so what will be interesting is what work has been undertaken to uh, address issues when it goes wrong? Because it will go wrong. Open banking is open banking, and, and therefore it lends itself to uh, cyber attacks, et cetera, et cetera. So probably two questions there. What's the key message from a marketing perspective, and how do you mitigate uh, maybe brand risk uh, from a communication perspective? On the first question, it's difficult for me to answer that question because we're not in that process of migrating, but I would say, would you, uh, it's almost, it feels to me like writing a check or, you know, doing contactless payment cards is kind of like it's the new standard. It's, it's safer, it's transparent and easy. But then again, I'm not the best person to answer that question. On the Jane from Cardiff question, um, what if something goes wrong? I think it's really important when you are connecting, when you, when you are providing that information for banks to be used within their banking app, that the first point of contact in, in this case is, or has, is and has always been pension B, when people have made mistakes or uh, things happen. At the moment, if I'm really honest, but there's no been money transactions taking place between pension B and banks. So for example, we are running trials now on uh, payments directly from banks into a pension B product. What if somebody makes a mistake and suddenly is in the pension wrapper? So how, what kind of process do you put in place? So, you know, cooling off periods, all of those things. We've also talked about um, the, um, um, the specific permission you've given um, uh, a third party t to connect uh, together, revoking that access. Uh, how easy do you make that to revoke it? There are some pretty, pretty rigid standards there, out there. Otherwise, we wouldn't a even be allowed to connect. So putting that aside, if something does go wrong, if people have questions, in our case, every customer has their own dedicated account manager, and that's within the app, and that's point of call to, to contact. I think I would Not like to answer to your I question. I would like to add is that uh, the key point here is that open banking uh, dynamics establish the liability model, mm. where, uh, first of all, third-party providers need to be regulated. I think this is the key yeah. point, because until now, you were working with the screen scrapers, and I mean, the, the TPPs were not regulated, are not regulated. So that's uh, the, 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 the issue is there. Now, within these dynamics, there is a liability model, and there are some rules that needs to mat I mean, needs to mature, and there is a lot of room of improvement. I can tell you, two weeks ago, we faced. I'm not going to name the TPP, but I, I'm going to name the, the the use case itself. A TPP started activity of paymentization services. That TPP is processing payments for an airline. We had two customers that they arrived to the airport to take the flight and the payment was not processed. And the customer, first of all, calls the bank. But the issue was not at the bank, it was with the TPP, the PISP, that didn't process correctly, and they acknowledged that they didn't process correctly the payment. They had an issue, and they reimbursed the money to the, to the customer, because actually the money was 
was executed and the payment was executed. But in the end, the customer missed the flight and there was a gap. So things go, I mean, may go wrong, definitely. But then it's about the liability model and all the, uh, um, let's say, uh, all the process that needs to be in place in order to tackle those situations. Okay, a lot of importance on customer-centric product and service design and on the TPPs to make sure that they have that blended model of digital first, but maybe backed up with a customer support and good integration. Yeah, uh, I can add a couple of things to that as well. I think it's, the, it's important to note, you know, we do have a, uh, a piece of work that's going on around creating a dispute management system, which will go live in, in the summer, which allows uh, any party to talk to another party within the open banking ecosystem and a set of rules that help to resolve uh, any kind of issues that may uh, come up. Um, so that will go some way towards uh, improving the way that the, 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 the industry um, deals with these things. But I think, um, I think there's another point, and which is that we operate a thing called a con the Consumer Forum, where we invite customer advocacy groups and charities and so on um, and to come and, uh, and, uh, and discuss with us all the key issues uh, around open banking. And the points you make are um, have been widely discussed, so we understand exactly uh, the responsibility there. Um, so those do get taken very seriously, and Eduardo, as, as, what, as Eduardo has said, you know the um, the liability issue, the dispute management system. Those are some of the things we can do. I think there is a bigger question, and that is around um, the regulatory framework. Now, to some extent, with payments, it's fairly straightforward because there's a regulatory framework for all of that. Um, I think that there is a gap, and I know that there are quite a few people that would agree with me, there is a gap insofar as if something goes wrong with the data you share, then GDPR, of course, will fine the company. It's quite a significant fine, 4% of turnover. Um, nobody wants that, but what it doesn't do is really do anything for the customer. The customer today, the customer journey they have to take, something goes wrong, it has some catastrophic consequence for them doesn't matter what, they have to then go to the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, and, and take their case to the ICO. The ICO will judge on that, and then they will give you their, their view on what's happened, and then you can then take that to court and take that company to court. Nobody's doing that, and rightly so, because it's a stupid thing to, to imagine that people are going to do that. There is a huge regulatory gap that needs to be addressed and that is that there should be much greater uh, control for the customer, there should be much greater um, uh, compensation, uh, particularly for things like consequential loss as a result of a data breach or something like that. And I think that's something where actually um, you know, the, the, the government needs to be applying some real thought and making sure that um, that, that kind of thing is addressed. And, and I'm optimistic that um, when uh, we really see what's emerging from this discussion about having a data regulator with real power, that, that that's one of the things that emerges is that there's much greater um, emphasis on making sure that the customer is looked after because the more data is shared, and it will happen a lot over the next 10 years or so, people will increasingly share their data, um, the more people need the protection and the compensation when things go wrong. So I think it's a really important regulatory question as well. Okay. Uh, conscious of time, one question over here. Yeah. Ooh, can't we, uh, Hold on. Yeah. Yeah, I can speak. Okay. Hi, Chihui, founder of Senior to Crypto Grannies Limited. Uh, so, when you look at financial services, so great transition questions from the previous one. When you look at financial services, here we have banking, we have funds, sort of, and then we forgot the coolest and sexiest industry, insurance. Sounds a little bit like not off topic, but it says what does financial services marketeers mean? So, will there ever one fine day be an open insurance or like can you, can you please like tell me? Oh, and also Centendia. Do you have an Instagram for Centendia UK? Pardon me? Do you have a Centendia UK Instagram? Because I can't find a handle. <laughs> Are you responsible for Instagram? <laughs> I'm not responsible okay. for that. Um, so, <laughs> Miles, well, you know we have a, we have we have a media group and they have everything. And uh, do we know oh, well. of anything in the insurance world that's going to be similar? Um, right now, I don't, uh, other than you know, people talking about, yes, would it be a good idea, but um, 
uh, I'm convinced it'll happen. I, I can't th tell you more than that. <laughs> <laughs> I think the yeah, one last question. Hi, uh, David Hetling, SDL PLC. Uh, I wondered how open open banking can get uh, in terms of globalization. How likely is it and in what time frame do you think organizations from abroad will be able to um, join the trust framework that you've been talking about this afternoon? So um, if you are an EU company uh, under PSD2, you can passport in, you can operate on the Open Banking Trust Framework today. No problem with that. Um, beyond that, uh, there are all kinds of discussions going on across different markets and, and, and a strong desire to bring greater compatibility between the different standards. And you know, there are, uh, there are even discussions around standardizing the standards, if you like. Um, so I think we're on a journey. I imagine that that's something that will come along. Um, it's not, I can't say, yeah, it's definitely going to happen, but I'm pretty sure it will do. Um, I think it's only a matter of time. It just needs to, to, to evolve, really. Yeah. Uh, it depends as well on the, on the reality of the, the other markets. I'll give you an example. Here in the UK, we have been uh, working with faster payments for more than 10 years already. If you go to Brazil, that will be a, a considerable uh, you know, market to compare with. They are going to start faster payments scheme as of 2020. So realities are different. So for instance, a payment initiation service uh, with a, a faster payment capability, I mean, it doesn't have the competitive advantage like uh, we may have here in the UK. So it's uh, things that you need to consider in order to uh, scale up to different regions. So as Miles was highlighting, uh, the standards are uh, uh, converging in terms of what has been done in open banking with PSD2 in, in Europe. So we can start working properly uh, between uh, the, the, the European economic area and, and, the, and, and the UK in particular. Uh, but then if we're talking about uh, integrating with uh, the US or Latin America uh, or going to other regions, I mean, that will take more time, definitely. Well, we're seeing interest from Canada. Um, so I'm going to do some quick questions, um, one word answers, um, if possible. Um, okay, open banking, obviously you can influence a lot. What's the most interesting sector service you think it will uh, be applied to? Obviously nothing as exciting as insurance, but where, where do you think it might be um, most, ex most excitingly applied? Outside financial services. Inside financial inside, services. Inside. So we've got pensions. I can, uh, maybe that's your answer. No, um, maybe, maybe not. Maybe what, not. what else exciting is going to come? Uh, I think the impact in for small businesses oh. is going to be mm. the... Uh, that's that's where you're going to see economic <laughs> impact first. And that's really exciting. Some of the stuff that's happening there. If not pensions? I'd say more uh, holistic view on your personal finances. So kind of like financial guidance. Actually, what I see is that uh, it, regardless of the segment, but particular perhaps on the retail one, uh, processes that uh, have been taken, I don't know, days, weeks uh, to apply for, uh, you, you will start to see you know, that those processes, timelines will you know, shrink considerably because the capability of sharing the data then is about the, all the KYC can happen in a much faster pace and therefore you will see a lot of those processes that implies that you need to apply and then s share data that before was more or less manual. You needed to handle a bunch of papers, etc. That will happen in a matter of seconds. So the process itself of the application for XYZ kind of product or service will be a matter of a minute. So that's gonna change dynamics that is not just financial services, but it's actually everything that depends on financial services. So if you need to share your bank account details and other things, that will reduce. Um, and final question. Um, what one quick bit of advice would you give to a marketing audience about open banking? Let's start that end. Think about it, what it means for your customer relationship. Okay. I won't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, um, don't underestimate the acquisition opportunity open banking can bring to your business. A third of our customers are acquired for open banking every day. Cool. 
I would say the technology normally goes quite faster that what people can understand the benefits that the, that technology may bring. So I think marketeers have a, a very interesting uh, you know task that is actually understanding what technology you know puts on the table and therefore translate that into a simpler way in a simple message so people can understand what they can benefit from open banking standards, I would say. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we're a little bit over, so I'll let um, Jacob conclude. Uh, but obviously, thank you very much, guys, for the, uh, the sharing of the, your thoughts. Um, if you're hanging around and the, you guys hanging around, there'll be a chance to probably interrogate him a little bit further. So I'm sure there's 101 more questions. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So yeah, please, a round, round of applause for our panel. <laughs> To the pub. <laughs> That's how I'll end this. Um, we're going to go downstairs to Balls Brothers Austin Friars, which is just a short alleyway from here, so very close to the building. But this is just one of a number of events we want to do. So we want to get your ideas for future events. We're planning a big one at the end of the year, the CIM Financial Services Summit uh, with the World Media Group. So stay tuned for more on that. And uh, thank you for attending today. <laughs>